I spend my days cataloguing artifacts. My evenings are spent decorating the king's palace. My father wants me to return to England, but England no longer feels like home. I long for the greater peace, but I am too much of a coward to face that. Richard is still never far from my thoughts. My grief grows strong again. It is only now that I feel everything has been done. Only the final hill to cross. I'm no longer at the centre, and I cannot cope with being in the shadows unless it is with you, Richard. So I choose to join you in the shadows. A cartoon riding by. A story of Gertrude Bell, the uncrowned Queen of Arabia. The year is 1926. I never understood why Gertrude's father asked me to look into the circumstances surrounding her death. Perhaps he wanted me to find out something that could make his loss less painful or help him to understand why she chose to die so far away from England and on her own. That's why I found myself at Roughton Grange in North Yorkshire, the country house of Sir Hugh Bell. Frank Stafford, I'm very pleased that you've been able to accept my invitation. It is good to get away from London, Sir Hugh. North Yorkshire is so peaceful and beautiful. Was Gertrude brought up here? No, she grew up at Red Barns, our home in Redcar, not far from the sea. Uh, when she was old enough, she went to Oxford, uh, one of the first women to attend there. I was so sorry to hear about her death, Sir Hugh. Frank, I had been trying to persuade her to come home to spend some time with us. She was tired by all that work after the war and personally disappointed by the settlement regarding Iraq at the Paris conference. Uh, I cannot. No, I will not accept that she took her own life. She was so much in love with life and her work. I'm aware that you have just left the Times and might be available to help me. You must find out everything. Get to the bottom of it for me. But, Sir Hugh, I'm not an investigator. I knew Gertrude and found her delightful, but... You I... served with her during the war, in the Arab office. You were an intelligence officer, I know. I know it's all supposed to be secret, but I still have my contacts, and I know... I know that you will be discreet. Gertrude was not in the best of health towards the end, but the coroner's report said accidental death. I need an explanation, Frank. He was partially right. I had done that kind of work during the war, but my intelligence work was analysis, not investigation. However, I agreed reluctantly to help and see what I could find out. After all, I had known her. She loved the Arab nation and worked hard towards making Faisal king of the new state of Iraq. She adored him. She also loved living in Baghdad. Her home there would be my first stop. There were maps, photographs, diaries, journals, all to be sorted. It would need more time and skill than I had to make some order and sense out of them. I needed to go there and speak to those who knew her, so I started at the High Commission in Baghdad. <laughs> Sir Francis Lascelles, it's good to see you again. Hello, Frank. How are you, my boy? Are you enjoying the delights of Baghdad? I'm fine, sir, but I'm not here for pleasure. Thank you for agreeing to meet me at such short notice. Tosh, delighted to see you. Actually, I'm only passing through on my way back to London. Retirement, you know. <laughs> More like being put out to grass. Anyway, what can I do for you? I suppose it's about this letter I've received from Hugh, asking me to offer you assistance. Well, how can I help you? I'm just trying to build up a picture about Gertrude and see where that takes me. You knew her when she arrived in Arabia for the first time, after she had finished at Oxford. Yes, I was at the High Commission in 1892 at the time of her first visit. 
She returned to work here in 1915. Then, when the war ended, she found a house overlooking the river. I believe her father bought it for her. She would sit in it all day, writing, talking, listening, and outside the people would be shouting, Khatoon! Khatoon! as they walked by. I thought that the cartoon title was just one of Gertrude's inventions, one of her stories. No, no, it was true. It meant queen. Khatoon meant queen. It's a word not often used, but only given to those who hold a special place with the local people. It shows that the people had a great respect for her and what she had done. I can still picture the scene. Hatun, 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 Dear Father, the house is beautiful. It has a rose garden and three summer houses, but a kitchen has to be built and a bathroom. There are sun blinds to go up, a thousand things to do. There will be cool breezes during the hot summer days. This is where I am going to do all my work. I've already started some new poetry translations. This country is so enchanting. The mountains and deserts are very beautiful. I spend the evenings in the rose garden listening to evening prayers. Looking out of my window, I can see the people of Baghdad. My life is beginning again. Oh, it's good to be me in Arabia. It was a happy time for Gertrude. Well, I thought it was. I must say that I still don't see why you have to come looking around. I thought that there would be plenty of stuff on her. Remember all those newspaper articles and headlines? Uncrowned Queen of Arabia or Uncrowned Queen of Mesopotamia? Yes, but... Those articles only tell me what Gertrude did, not who she was. Perhaps you could tell me about her time here and something about Henry Cadogan. Oh, Cadogan. You've heard about him, then? Yes, I came across his name in one of her journals. Do you know I introduced them? <laughs> you say that as if you regretted it. He was a cheat and a coward. It was 1893. No, 92. I suppose that was my first mistake, picking Cadogan to escort Gertrude. But how was I to know she would fall for a damned gambler and a disgrace to the Foreign Service? Don't blame yourself, Sir Francis. It was the first time abroad for her, in what was a romantic atmosphere and being escorted by a young man. I can remember it clearly. And how it ended so tearfully, about six months after I had brought them both together. Of course I must leave, Uncle. Is it that bad, Gertrude? Do you have to do this? Father has ordered me home, and after all, he controls the purse strings. Is Henry going with you? Of course he isn't. I thought that was patently obvious. You saw to it that it wouldn't happen. If it wasn't for your... Gertrude, is there no way in which we can resolve this? No, I have to return to England. I have been told to show restraint. I did not want it to come to this, but I was only thinking of your best interest. You did not give him a chance. If my father had met Henry, he would have accepted that our love was real and natural and approved of our becoming betrothed. Will you be seeing Henry? Why? Do I need your permission? Of course not! I know what this is really about, that he is an outsider. Do not pretend that you are doing this for me! You see, Frank, I had written to her father, telling him what I thought about Henry Cadogan. Hugh felt that was enough to demand that Gertrude came home. And Gertrude? Gertrude had been swept off her feet. Henry was her first love. Well, he overwhelmed her. She was very unhappy when she left for England. She didn't speak to me for two years, not until Henry died. You didn't know? Yes, about two years later, he contracted typhoid and died. How did it all affect her? What did she do? Home at first. 
She consoled herself translating Persian poetry, which she had published. And then she started to explore. By now, I think she had been overwhelmed by Arabia. Where did she explore? Everywhere. I think she even went on one of those Thomas Cook journeys around the world. Her first desert journey was to Palmyra. Around the world and into the desert. Was she trying to escape from Henry's memory or her father? Or perhaps both? There followed many journeys. Archaeological expeditions. Wasn't that how you first met her? Yes, I first met her when she was excavating Carchemish. In 1912. These stones can tell us what has gone on in the past. Eventually you will be able to tell that not all these inscriptions were made at the same time, nor were they carved by the same people. The one which we cleaned up yesterday was at least 600 years old, whilst this one is only 200 but we can build up a picture of this area. The words tell a story. Sometimes I wonder why we go to all this trouble. The people who carved these stones died. We shall die. What difference does it make? Perhaps none, Frank. But then again, maybe someone can live on. Someone, for example, in this stone. We know their name, how they lived, when they died. I believe that this is a part of the mystery of being here. It's history and antiquity, civilizations existing long before ours did. There is a chance that we can live on like that, perhaps through our work. Come on, I want to be finished by today. We must leave this site tomorrow. I had further questions for Sir Francis and returned to the High Commission. Have you found anything of interest yet, Frank? Not yet. But may I mention a name to you? Doughty Wiley. I've been told by ex-colleagues that there was a rumour that swept through the troops at Gallipoli that a woman had been allowed by the French to visit a grave. Wasn't Doughty Wiley's grave in the French troop sector? Hmm? This lady stepped ashore near Cape Hellas on the southern end of the peninsula, and, without speaking to anyone, marched up to his grave, knelt for some time, then stood, placed a wreath at the wooden cross, and left. I've heard that rumour, and I believe that's all it is. A rumour that created something different for those poor soldiers to talk about, rather than the terrible war that they were in. Others said that it was Doughty Wiley's wife, if it was Gertrude, she took that secret to her grave. I really doubt it. I believe it was just one of those Gallipoli myths. I wondered when Hugh told me you were carrying out this work for him whether this would come up. I'm sorry if it causes you some anxiety, but I'm trying to build up a picture of Gertrude, especially recently. You mean at the end, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid I do. First, I must ask something of you. What do you intend to do with all the information that you find? Publish? No, good heavens, no. I am here as a favour to Sir Hugh, and he knows and trusts me to be discreet. I also knew Gertrude and would like to know what happened. You don't want to hurt in any way. Partly that. But I do not want her father hurt any more. It has been especially painful for him. Gertrude was the apple of his eye. There is no trace of scandal with these two people. Two people who are well-known public figures. But it is important that I know everything. After all, why does a wealthy, educated, well-connected Englishwoman become so involved in the Arab world? In fact, so involved that she ends up dying in Baghdad, unhappy and alone. You are nothing if not persistent. I feel that she wanted her relationship with Doughty Wiley to move on and grow. But as he was married, the scandal would have destroyed them. 
They were both very ambitious. Gertrude was introduced to Doughty Wiley by a friend, after one of her jaunts through the desert. He was the consul in Konya, a small place in Turkey, when they first met. There appears to have been two great loves in her life. One, this army hero who died at Gallipoli but was already married. The other was Iraq. I can't help feeling that both were unsatisfactory affairs in the end. Miss Bell, this is indeed an honour. I have heard so much about you. A pleasure, Captain Doughty Wiley. Forgive me if I'm late. I've just finished a long journey. And how were the churches, Miss Bell? You know of the churches? Byzantine, I believe. I must also say that I enjoyed your book immensely. How interesting. A soldier who can read. And the deserts of Syria. You must have faced dangers there. Marauding tribesmen everywhere. But they would not harm a woman. Ha! <laughs> you have faith in Arab customs. Of course I do. Did you like my book? Yes. All your love and enthusiasm for Arabia is captured in it. But still, there is something of you missing. It's almost as if you are observing from a distance. You never write yourself in. It's rather like your photographs. I cannot remember seeing you in one. That is because I am an observer. I have to be detached if I am going to record information honestly and objectively. It must almost be the same for you when you are working tactics and strategy out. Yes, but sometimes in warfare feelings can try to take over. Anxiety, panic, fear, cowardice. How do you control them? My training. And my responsibility for my men makes me control those feelings. Have you been involved in lots of conflicts? I'm afraid so, unfortunately. I tend to be in the right places, but at the wrong times. I think that you probably enjoy the risks and the dangers. There are times when I suppose I do. But after all, I am a professional soldier, so those risks are part of my chosen life. But at these times I do think about my family and my wife. Ah, your wife. Where is she and your family? And they're at home in Suffolk. I leave for Turkey tomorrow. For more adventures? That sounds exciting. I hope so, Miss Bell. I hope so. We appear to have a great deal in common. I hope that distance will not be a barrier to a possible friendship. Of course not. We could perhaps communicate by letter from wherever we both are. I think that I should like that. Gertrude, over here. Gertrude. Ah, last she's seen me. Richard. Here, sit. Thank you. Waiter, would you bring me some tea and some fresh cakes, please? Oh, dear, Richard, I'm sorry that I'm late, but you'll never guess why. I've been at the Royal Geographical Society all day. They've agreed to support my plans for the new expedition, and they have given me the promise of equipment and supplies. It sounds exciting. Just what exactly do you hope to do? I'm planning to travel from Damascus to Baghdad via Hail. I want to meet my Ibn al-Rashid. God, Rashid. but that's an impossible task. You're going to need an enormous expedition. No, oh no, there is only going to be myself. I intend to do this one alone. I'm going to cross that huge expanse by myself. I shall, of course, have Fatu with me. He's my guide and sorts out workers and travel for me. That is to say, he purchases the camels. It would certainly be an amazing crossing, Gertrude, and, and alone at that. I wonder how you'll be greeted. I doubt anyone there has ever set eyes on a European woman. You mustn't take any risks. Don't be so paternalistic. I mean other than the risks that you will meet from time to time. After all, on a solitary journey of this magnitude, there will be risks and dangers. What does trouble me, Gertrude, is that I know your thirst for adventure. <laughs> I can assure you that I have no intention of becoming a desert bandit. I have dreamt, planned and schemed over this for so many years that I'm not going to jeopardise its successful outcome by taking unnecessary risks. Can you recall when we first met, when you were the consul in Konya in 1907? Remember when I came to collect my letters from you? Of course I do. 
Well, that is when I first started to seek permission from the authorities for this journey. It has taken me six years. Perhaps now you can see why I don't intend to create any problems. At last, my cakes. I do so wish that I was travelling with you. But you are going to Albania. A new adventure is beginning for both of us. Ever since you told me about your posting to Albania, I've been thinking about us. Perhaps this separation might be a good thing. At present, I find that all my thoughts and energies are channeled into our relationship. During the next few weeks, I'm going to need time to sort out the details of my expedition without too much distraction. I know what you mean. I start to write reports and they end up as letters to you. It does cause difficulties and frustrations. Your frustration? How do you think I feel when I realise that things between us will never be any different? There appears to be no hope for our friendship developing into anything else. I thought we had agreed at the beginning that there could be nothing more for us. I know, I know, but things have changed. You must recognise that. How was I to know how strong and deep my feelings for you would become? I have never felt like this before. And what am I to think when you tell me that you love me? Oh, Richard, why can't there be some hope? It is impossible, Gertrude. Don't ask this of me. We must accept that we can only have a little time together. We each have other responsibilities. Think what the newspapers would do with it. You, the famous traveller, me, the military hero. And to think that it was your bravery that first attracted me. Every time I picked up a paper, you were winning another medal somewhere for another heroic deed. We can still meet in thoughts and fantasies. That is not enough, Richard. It is not enough for me. And I think it is another reason to get away. This journey might help me to sort out some of my feelings and confusions about us. Then we must go our separate ways. You to Baghdad and myself to Albania. Suffolk, 1913. Dear Gertrude, I am closely following your journey. Whilst you are using roads through Persia, you should remain relatively safe. Once you strike out across the desert, however, you are in unknown territory. But I know you and how you will revel in the adventure and the danger of it all. January 1913. Dear Richard, Today we crossed the railway line that runs between the hills of Moab and the desert. This will be the last contact between us, or anyone else for that matter. I shall now be completely alone as I turn toward Nejd. I am discovering the real meaning of loneliness. During the long days and the long evenings, my thoughts have wandered to us, to what has happened and what might happen. At times it is so painful. Sometimes I have gone to bed so sad and depressed that I thought that I would never survive another day. Then the dawn, that desert dawn, rises soft and friendly, speeding across the dunes and the wastes, until it inches into my frozen, sad heart. I wonder... Is that all I can hope for? Suffolk, January 1913. What stage are you at? Are you still in good health and making progress? Are your helpers working hard? There is so much to ask, so many dangers I can only imagine. Please, please take care. I have hoped for a friendship like ours. Is it helping you, being so far away? Have you been able to resolve anything about us? January 1913 Dear Richard, I feel as if I have been at your side all this time, through all your adventures and heroics. 
perhaps if it is possible, and I know that you will try and make it so, you can spend some time at Rounton House with us. I have taken a terrible risk coming here. If the gossip mongers get to hear about this, they could destroy my career. Don't worry, Richard. No one will know. After all, you are here as a house guest of father. Light of mine eyes and harvest of my heart, and mine at least in changeless memory. Richard, are we doing the right thing? Of course we are. Have you not enjoyed the past six months since you finished your journey? It has been wonderful. I only wish that I could show you off to father and mother. Gertrude, you, you talk of me as if I'm some prize or, or an archaeological find. Well, you are, Richard. You are the find of my life. Do you think that they will ever approve of me? Oh, yes, Richard. Oh, yes, they will. I know that one day father will approve and, more importantly, will like and respect you. I'm sorry for us both, Gertrude. You are spoiling my happiness. Sorry. I know that this time is special for us. You've told me things that I only dared dream that you would say. Richard, we have so little time. We must break this impasse. I cannot see how. My position, my family, my needs... How would we survive? What about my needs, Richard? Sometimes you have to reach out and trust people, and they will respond, but you have to do the initial work. We must show restraint. Restraint! 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 <laughs> Your father tells me you are off to work for the Red Cross in France. Women are not allowed to be heroic and face the enemy. <laughs> you, who've crossed uncharted Arabian deserts, been held prisoner by Rafiq warriors, you, the cartoon. Good heavens, heroics are second nature to you. Oh, very well, Richard, but you know what I mean. How much longer will you be here? You said that we had two more days. Things have changed. We cannot have this time together. Why not? What has changed? In this house, I feel your desires. Desires that would consume both of us. A shadow visited me last night. It wanted to come into my bed. And? I was more scared for us at that moment than at any other time. But an idea has come to me. A solution. Yes, Richard. A solution? My life. That is the answer. Do not look at me like that, Gertrude. It makes sense. My wife and you would be spared. You must not talk like this. You frighten me. Too often you talk of the worship of a quiet death. There is no life after death, and what would be left? Me alone. No, you cannot. You must not. Oh, God, is this all my fault? It will be all over soon, Gertrude. My wooden horse of Troy will see all our problems disappear. Please, Richard, not like this. I am thinking of things of philosophy, of love and of life, of evenings at Roughton and what it all means. And now you go off to war once again. Please, please do not let your heroics stand in our way. My dearest Gertrude, 
This letter is so painful to write as it brings you dreadful news about Richard. He has been killed in action leading his troops ashore, charging the Turkish guns. I know this will be an awful shock to you. The landings in Gallipoli are a complete failure. Please come home immediately if you find it necessary. I have written a note of condolence to his poor wife. Oh, Richard, no. Gallipoli was not meant to be Troy. Ah! Gertrude, are you asleep, my dear? No, father. Come and join me, please. Oh, it is so good to have you home. Although I thought you might want to be at Ranson Grange. No, father. There are too many sad memories there for me. What on earth could those... It is hard to explain, and you would not be able to understand. Isn't it peaceful? Listen. Listen very carefully and you can hear the waves breaking on the shore. Tomorrow I shall go for a walk along the sands. Are you strong enough yet? Don't fuss, Father. I'm confident that I can cope with a little walk on the foreshore. Oh, it's so safe here. And so far away from the real world. At least we're unable to hear the terrible sounds that the guns in France make. There is never any respite from them. I'm told that on the south coast on a summer's day... One can hear the barrage from the front. And now the Dardanelles. All those boys being killed at Gallipoli. It looks as though Winston will have to resign over it. I also heard that Colonel Doughty Wiley... I'm sorry. I know how fond of him you were. We all were. I don't wish to cause you unnecessary pain but I thought you might like to know that he has been recommended for the Victoria Cross. Such a brave man. Still, as I was saying, Winston is having to face the, the cabinet this week. Oh, dear God! Oh, oh, Richard! Richard! Why, oh, why? What good is a medal, a piece of bronze... What kind of substitute is that? When you were here, life was beautiful. I was alive again. We could have been so good for each other. But you left me, Richard. I lost you. Oh, my love. We are both lost. <laughs> These gardens are beautiful, Gertrude. And this is such a charming house. I know. It's a second home for me. I've been coming here ever since Grandfather built it. Ah, don't English gardens have a unique smell? Sometimes in the desert, I can smell the honeysuckle and the clematis so strongly that I could be sitting back in my garden in Suffolk. I know what you mean, Richard. But I found Persian gardens which are as unique in their fragrances. The first time that I went to Persia, I stayed at a house with such a garden. I can remember spending the mornings in a hammock, which was strung between the plain trees, reading the poems of Hafiz. In the original? <laughs> of course. How else would one? Well, if you must know, I did hide my dictionary under my petticoats. But I can still hear that tiny stream murmuring past me and see all the flowers that it fed. That sounds idyllic, but idylls can never be maintained. The moment goes. Songs of dead laughter, songs of love once hot. Your translation of the poems of Hafiz never ceases to charm me. I find something new every time I return to it. In fact, dear Gertrude... You amaze me in many ways. Do I, Richard? Come now, what are the ways? Do tell me, please. Well, for a start, this part of the garden you're in. Your grandfather tells me that you designed it and planted it. Anyone can put a few seeds in the ground. 
And don't forget that Grandfather does have gardeners. It's not as though I have to do everything myself. So that's not really amazing. Come on, you'll have to do better than that. In what other ways? I find your thoughts, your ideas, your intellect so stimulating. When I'm in your presence... Oh, Gertrude, at the moment you are constantly in my thoughts. I've offended you. I'm sorry. No, no, Richard, of course you haven't. I'm not offended. Surprised, but not offended. I just didn't realise that you felt like that. It's more than I could have hoped for. In fact, the same thing is happening to me. You are with me all my waking moments. Does that shock you? No, not shocked. Stunned, perhaps. It feels so good to know that you feel this way. But it's also dangerous. Dangerous? I don't understand. Gertrude, I'm married. What future can there be for us? Think what any scandal would do. Our families would be destroyed. The press would tear us apart. You, the famous Arabian traveller, me, the war hero and diplomat. Don't you think that I haven't thought of that? I'm 43, Richard. Neither of us is in the first flush of youthful infatuation. But despite the risks, I still want to see you, be with you. Why do you think I had Grandfather invite you to be his house guest? So that I could be alone with you, without arousing suspicion and starting gossip. I've always wanted us to be closer, ever since we first met. It moves me so much when I hear you say these things. Hold my hand, please. No one can see us in this part of the garden. Hold me, Richard. Please hold me. And you did, Richard. You did. You held me tightly. And for the first time in years, I felt like a whole person. Your strength and love transmitted itself into my whole being. My body, my heart. Oh, Richard, come back. <laughs> Please come back. That's right, Captain Doughty Wiley, Richard Doughty. I'm the Vice Consul here. Honoured to meet you, Miss Bell. Y you must come and dine. Richard! Richard! Where are you? I'm being seconded to an Australian division, but I've arrived here four days early. Officially, I'm not here. We could spend these few days together, Gertrude. Oh, yes, Richard. Oh, yes. Richard! Richard! A medal. The Victoria Cross. Such a brave young man. Richard, come back! Where are you? Richard, come back! Gertrude, Gertrude, are you all right? Are you feeling unwell again? You're not listening. Oh, what? Oh, Father, I'm sorry. I drifted off. My mind was miles away. Well, I suppose it was only political gossip. I imagine what goes on in the war cabinet must seem fairly boring to you. That isn't so, Father. You work yourself so hard, my dear. I realise how much you love your Arabic studies and your beautiful Babylon. But you do drive yourself. And now all this work in France with the Red Cross, trying to trace missing relatives. How distressing and harrowing it must all be. It's not that, but... Oh dear, I must be such a disappointment to you and Mother. Don't you wish that I had settled down and made a good marriage like my sisters instead of gadding about in the desert? It must have caused you all kinds of anxieties, travelling with Bedouins and adventurers. I wouldn't want it any different. 
Gertrude. You must always do what you choose, and I will always support you. You have been a great help and friend to me. It's not that I don't want to tell you. It's just that there are some parts of me which are private and concern me and my life. I can understand that. But talking about your life, uh, have you had any thoughts about returning to France? I received a letter yesterday from Dr. Hogarth. He's involved in setting up an Arab intelligence bureau and has asked me to join it. Will you go? Yes, I think so. I need something to stop me from brooding. If I start working again, I think that it will help. Certainly in Arabia, I can make a greater contribution to the war effort. All I have to look forward to now is my work. Oh, there is such sadness in you, Gertrude. And such pain. I do not understand. Perhaps growing old means that I'm growing away from you. During the past 12 months, much has happened to me. Most of it I will always remember with pleasure. But I couldn't live through the pain and sorrow again. Perhaps because of it I might become a better person. Certainly a different one. But there are still things which I can't talk about. And they will always be in my mind. Ooh, there is an evening chill setting in. I'm cold. Can we go inside now and have some hot tea? I returned from Baghdad to Roundton Grange to meet with Gertrude's father again and report back on my mission. But what was I to say? I was mindful that Sir Francis had asked me to spare his feelings. My last interview had been with David Hogarth. Gertrude and I had worked for him in the Arab Bureau during and after the war. Sir Hugh... Hogarth told me that the Secret Intelligence Service was interested in her. Are you serious, Frank? Well, I know they were interested, as we had difficulties with them at the peace conference. They suspected Gertrude's relationship with Weissel was too close, that she was in awe of him, too friendly and too easily influenced towards the Arab cause. Hogarth used to say that all the government wanted was their own man. The puppet and the oil. I think that you are too suspicious. The government wants what is right for the people of Iraq. I'm sure that is so. Anyway, I cannot accept that the British government would have had anything to do with her death. But you knew her too at the Bureau in the desert at Carthamish. Yes, I met her just before her expedition to Ha'il across totally uncharted desert in search of Byzantine castles. It was a magnificent journey, and she was even imprisoned by Rafik tribesmen for five days. But she survived it all. She was a remarkably strong woman, very determined, and I think this helped in part with Faisal. What made her join the Bureau? I recall that she told me she was going, but offered me no explanation why, other than that she wanted to get away from France. What made her join the Bureau? I wonder. I think it was the opportunity to use all her experiences about Arabia for the war effort. Hogarth had just set up the agency. He had read her books and was familiar with her work. He knew all about her expedition, her knowledge of the language and culture, so he asked her to join. You were there then. Do you remember it? Yes, I was there. Gertrude and I worked together for a while. Let us sit in the garden, Frank. In the early evening, I find it so pleasant and calm. It is, Gertrude. It is so heavenly. But sometimes, Frank, I do not feel that. Sometimes I am so sad that I would gladly exchange everything. All the journeys, the books, the recognition. All for some time with Richard. Because that is what I really want. Not those transient symbols of fame but some companionship, 
some comfort, some warmth, some love in my life. My life is so empty, and all the books and all the memories do not seem to help. <coughs> oh, Frank, I bore you going on about myself. I am so sorry. I am glad that you have called. It will give us an opportunity dis to discuss the future of Iraq. That is not why I am here. Gertrude, apparently information regarding our diplomatic overtures to Persia has been communicated to certain people in the Iraq government. I know that the commissioner suspects you, and as a colleague, but more as a friend, I thought I had better warn you. Don't you think that senior members of the government should be aware of what their so-called friends and advisers are up to? I do. I agree, but there are proper channels, and I suppose we should follow them. <sighs> but only if it suits our purposes do we use these channels. I have met with Faisal, and I found him intelligent and charming, an ideal king. I asked him whether he believed in my personal sincerity and devotion to him. He said he could not doubt it. I said in that case I could speak with perfect freedom. He is the very picture of a dashing Arab prince, pure and driven as a snow king. He is right for this country and right for the people. I'm only passing on to you what I've heard as a friend. And I'm only trying to support the people of the country. The desert Arabs were my friends. When I was isolated from the world on my travels, they were my family. But that doesn't mean that they are the right people to govern the country. We have to look at the different factions and find a leader who can unite them all. It is so difficult when there is a tradition of tribal law. They will not take kindly to the British imposing rule upon them. This is not the time to be squeamish, Gertrude. There is much at stake here, and I suspect that the British government wants to retain... How shall I put this? It's influence, I suppose, is what I'm saying. That is why, then, we should help Faisal become king. But I always find those in charge trying to block my meetings with him. We are supposed to be apolitical advisers of the High Commission to Iraq. And as such are bound by certain ethics of behaviour in relation to secrecy. But that is ridiculous. How can we hope to achieve open government if we ourselves are not seen to practice it? After all, we created this country and its system of government. If you do not have an open mind, you cannot be objective and your actions could alienate Faisal. That is unfair, Frank. I could never do that to him. We must go and fight his cause at the peace conference. Yes. Perhaps. Not perhaps. Most definitely. So you see, Sir Hugh... We made Faisal king of Iraq when we divided up Arabia at the Paris conference. That must have been a good moment for Gertrude. But at the time, I did not think that she quite appreciated what was at stake. Perhaps you underestimated her, her knowledge of the people. No, but perhaps we underestimated the British government, which felt that it had to be in Iraq for the oil. Oil, it argued, was the key. Frank, I've not thanked you yet for agreeing to come and see me today. Sir Hugh, some of the things I've found out may be very painful for you to hear. I can assure you that I did not want you to deny me any of the details about her life. I wanted you to paint me a true portrait of Gertrude. Well, finally I found out that her birth and upbringing gave her confidence in handling situations. But it was her personal relationships and attempts to be independent which caused her so much pain. Indeed, we have to ask her what were all her travels about. Was she only trying to escape the world of her life and family? 
If so, I think she failed. For we take our reality with us wherever we go. It is never left in the wings. I suppose she was an incorrigible romantic. She was. But I don't think she could find anything romantically encouraging after the war. And what of the events leading up to her death? I found out that shortly before she died, Gertrude did seem to lose her way. Frank, don't be hesitant. I want to know my daughter. Her mistakes only make me closer to knowing who she really was. It's just that not long before... She was suspected of sending classified information to her friends without first clearing it through the commissioner. She saw these accusations as being based on tall tales and rumours. Unfortunately, they were seen as breaches of confidence. She was transferred to the Department of Archaeology and started to develop the National Museum of Iraq for King Faisal. You told me facts that may suggest her state of mind. But tell me, Frank, was her death deliberate or accidental? It's impossible for me to say for certain how she died. And that's the truth. Thank you, Frank, for your work and time. Even after what you were able to find out, I don't know why she ended up in that position. I think she could not betray her class, her background, her family. Yet, the more I hear about her, I'm coming to realise that there were parts of Gertrude's life that I did not know about or understand. Restraint. I think it was always restraint from her father. He knew nothing of how she really felt, or indeed how Richard's memory had never left her. When she learned that he had died charging the Turks, leading his men with only a walking stick in his hand, she no doubt kept thinking about his words about a death which would be better for Gertrude and his wife. His death was an immense shock, and it should not be underestimated how deeply his death affected her. Baghdad, June 1926. Dear Father, I don't feel that I can go on much longer alone. My existence here has become so lonely. I am still mindful of all that has gone on before. Things that will never happen again. Everyone has left. I am alone. They have all returned to England, but I do not want to return. My England has gone forever. The only solace that I find is in Arabia. My home. I had formed a beautiful and gracious snow image to which I had given allegiance and now I see it melting before my eyes. Before every noble outline has been obliterated, I prefer to go. In spite of my love for the Arab nation and my sense of responsibility for its future, I do not think I could bear to see the evaporation of the dream which has guided me day by day. I have laid down my pen, Father, because I do not want to commit these thoughts to paper. I could not bear to read them again, nor could I inflict them on anyone else. I can feel myself sinking down into those dark depths once more. My hope was that it would never happen again. My greatest fear, that it would. If I cannot recapture the past, can I come to terms with the pain that lies between the past and now? I am so weary these days. So tired, yet unable to sleep. All around me are changes. 
They cause me such sadness. Perhaps because I am no longer able to cope with them. This is so uncomfortable. It was so simple and clear all those years ago when I was in the desert. Everything seemed to be so clean and pure. I do not think that I can bear this loneliness much longer. Deep inside me there is so much anguish. More than I can carry. I am so tired. So very tired. Richard. Oh, Richard. We shall walk together again soon. So very, very soon. Riding by by Pete Thomas. Gertrude Bell was played by Dawn Iverson. Frank Lascelles and Richard Doughty Wiley were played by Rob Clilford. Frank Stafford was played by Jack McBride. Hugh Bell was played by Ray Burton. Percussion by Ronnie Burke. Guitars by Richard Pink. Vocals by Scarlet Pink.